So good, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch break, all energized and ready to listen to some more exciting talks. Um, the first two will be 10 minute talks, um, and there is also some room for questions. And uh, after that, there will also be some five minute talks without room for questions. Um, and first, we'll start with a talk from Timea Komlodi, who is already there, who will talk about the protomotive force. Um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and thank you for Eric and our Boros team inviting me for this special event. Uh, spending five years here in Innsbruck, I always enjoy coming back to, to, to visit you and, and meet now. <clears throat> and today I will talk about the protomotive uh, force and about uh, measuring the components of the protomotive uh, uh, force. And this presentation is based on a, a preprint, which will be or it is accepted in bioenergetics communication and uh, on one of my old uh, papers which was published in uh, Journal of Bioenergetics and Biomembranes. So Peter Mitchell uh, was uh, awarded uh, 1978 Nobel Prize for Chemistry uh, for uh, discovering the chemiosmotic mechanism of ATP uh, synthesis in uh, 19 or in his uh, 1961 nature uh, paper uh, he reveals uh, four postulates and uh, oops sorry and uh, the first module uh, or first part of this chemiosmetic theory that there is a reversible translocating proton uh, uh, f atpase in the membrane that the second one is that there are hydrogen ion pumps in the membrane and uh, the hydrogen ion uh, translocation is coupled to electron neutral and uh, reversible uh, exchange uh, of cations against hydrogen ion and of anions against hydro hydroxyl uh, ions. And the fourth one is that there is a coupling uh, membrane in which these uh, three uh, modules can be uh, found. And this membrane has no or low permeability, permeability for uh, ions. And the ATP A's or the ATP synthase uh, uses the protomotive force, these hydrogen ion pumps, so the complexes uh, generating the protomotive force, and the ion transport can modulate uh, the protomotive uh, force. And as you know, the protomotive force consists of a chemical and an electrical uh, part, and um, we are able to measure both. Uh, the chemical and the electrical parts so the mitochondrial membrane potential and the transmembrane uh, pH. So measuring the mitochondrial membrane potential is, is widely uh, uh, accepted, so there are general methods to measure mitochondrial membrane potential. One of the most common uh, ways are fluorescence uh, techniques. These are easy to uh, use, but of course they have several uh, advantages. Uh, the basis or how these dye work, I think you know, you all know. So there is a lipophilic cationic dye which can enter the mitochondrial uh, matrix uh, depending on the mitochondrial membrane potential, and then they can uh, create dimers and decrease uh, or quench um, each other's uh, fluorescence. So when the mitochondrial membrane potential is high, for example, when you add a substrate, in this case uh, succinate, then the mitochondrial uh, membrane potential increases, and this is reflected in decrease of, uh, of the signal, of the fluorescent uh, signal. And when you add ADP, for example, this leads to depolarization of the mitochondrial uh, membrane, and which is reflected in the increase of the fluorescent signal. There are other uh, ways or there are methods to measure mitochondrial membrane potential. These are the so-called ion-selective electrodes, for example, uh, a TPP uh, electrode. This is not so easy to use, but conversion of, uh, of uh, a calculation of uh, uh, the membrane potential in millivolts is much more uh, easier. Uh, measuring the Intramitochondrial pH or the intermembrane pH is much more uh, challenging. There are fluorescence uh, dyes uh, available which are pH uh, sensitive. And uh, one of these dyes, what uh, I have been using, is the BCACF uh, Easter uh, form, which can enter, in this case, if you work with isolated mitochondria, uh, which can enter the mitochondrial matrix. And then the BCACF uh, AM will be hydrolyzed by intramitochondrial esterases. And then the free fluorescence BCF uh, is uh, 
uh, can be protonated and deprotonated. And the advantage of BCACF that it has a pH dependent and independent uh, um, region in, in its fluorescence uh, spectra uh, and which uh, allows uh, for ratiometric uh, fluorescence. So using two excitation uh, wavelengths and um, the fluorescence data can be converted to pH values after equalizing the intra and extra mitochondrial pH and then uh, uh, using uh, nitrium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide for calibration. Here is a typical uh, uh, figure uh, using BCACF after calculation or conversion of the fluorescence signal into intra mitochondrial pH and then calculating uh, the delta pH. Um, what we can see here that after the addition of uh, succinates, so these are isolated uh, guinea pig brain mitochondria, uh, we can see an alkalization of the mitochondrial matrix, which is followed by uh, ADP addition and uh, uh, acidification of the mit mitochondrial uh, uh, matrix. Nigericin, I will talk about it later, is a potassium hydrogen um, ion um, exchanger, uh, which uh, leads to uh, acidification of the mitochondrial matrix. And um, mm, then uh, what is interesting here is the FCCP, which is, uh, which is an uncoupler. So it leads to acidification of the mitochondrial uh, matrix. And uh, usually, uh, like the like, uh, uncoupler FCCP changes the mitochondrial membrane uh, potential and the delta pH in the same direction, so both decrease. But uh, using ionophores, we can modulate uh, or modulate the delta, the delta pH and the mitochondrial membrane potential in different uh, directions. Uh, this could be important if you want to detect separately the effect of these, uh, the components of the proton motive force on a specific mitochondrial parameter. For example, we did so with um, studying the effect of these uh, components on the reverse electron transfer associated or linked hydrogen peroxide uh, production. So we use nigericin, which is a potassium uh, uh, hydrogen ion exchanger, and volinomycin, which is a uh, uh, which makes uh, the membrane uh, permeable to uh, to potassium ions. And what we could see here, again with succinate, we can initiate this reverse electron transfer in the absence of ADP. Then nigericin uh, acidified. Uh, the mitochondrial uh, matrix, which could uh, f uh, further uh, then be uh, decreased by the addition of an uh, uncoupler, uh, like uh, with volinomycin, we achieved exactly the opposite effect. So it led to alkalization uh, of the mitochondrial matrix. And then under the same condition, we measure the mitochondrial membrane potential and the hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, production. And uh, what we could see that nigericin uh, hyperpolarized the membrane, uh, and uh, in line with this, it increased the hydrogen peroxide production in the presence of uh, succinate, so it promoted this reverse electron transfer, so the membrane potential and the hydrogen peroxide flux was changed in the same direction. And then uh, we tried also, uh, we carried out experiments with volinomycin, which uh, decreased the membrane potential, and in line with this, it uh, inhibited or reduced the hydrogen uh, peroxide flux initiated with uh, succinate. So based on, based on this data, we can say uh, that uh, the higher component of the protomotive force, so the mitochondrial membrane potential, uh, has a greater effect or a dominant role over delta pH in modulation or in modulating uh, the reverse electron transfer related hydrogen peroxide uh, flux. Then we studied the effect of the extra mitochondrial pH on the H2 to production and on the transmembrane uh, pH. What we could see, again, uh, uh, we carried out these experiments under the same condition uh, using guinea pig uh, brain mitochondria in the presence of five millimolar succinate. What we could see here that the H2 to production was increasing while the delta pH decreased uh, upon pH elevation. So these data also show that uh, uh, reverse, so the succinate induced reverse electron flow is not influenced by the changes of delta pH, rather it is dependent on the changes of the membrane uh, potential, and in this case, on the absolute pH values. So we can conclude that the proton motive force is not equal to mitochondrial membrane potential, as it said, 
or as it's stated in many, many uh, papers, and we can measure both components of the uh, proton motif force, so the mitochondrial membrane potential and the uh, delta pH. And uh, applying these uh, ion of force, we could um, conclude uh, that the mitochondrial membrane potential is dominant over delta pH in uh, modulating the reverse electron transfer evoked hydrogen peroxide production, and the absolute pH uh, has higher impact on loss production than the delta pH. So thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions from the audience? Thank you for uh, making us aware that delta psi is not everything in the proton motive force. Now, uh, you published with us in Beck uh, the oxygen dependence of hydrogen peroxide production, and I mean, we have a joint paper in, pre uh, in preparation looking at the relationship to delta mm -hmm. psi and hydrogen peroxide flux. So, how did you control for oxygen in your measurements here? Was it always at comparable oxygen levels? Because the oxygen dependence mm -hmm. of hydrogen peroxide flux, it's your work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so how does this now relate to your present mm -hmm. uh, I mean comparison this, yeah. delta pH versus yeah. delta psi? Yeah, so these are my old data, so at this time, uh, we had an old fluorometer, so where we could not really control uh, the oxygen concentration, but the experiments were carried out in uh, 15 minutes or 20 uh, minutes, so, and there was an open chamber, uh, so the oxygen concentration was, was uh, always relatively high, yeah. Yes, uh, we had quite good success with the BCECFAM mm -hmm. approach as well. The only cautionary note that I would offer would be that uh, if your particular mitochondrial uh, system uh, is shifted to the more alkaline range mm -hmm. in the upper pH, you know, 7, 7, 7, 8, seven, eight. then you're approaching the asymptotic relationship of the standard curve usually uh, with that fluorescent signal and it becomes a little bit less accurate. But mm -hmm. certainly in the range up to seven, six, seven, seven, we find it to be absolutely very reliable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we measure between uh, 6.4 uh, and, and 7.8. .7 and yeah, this was probably the, the limit of, of, of this, this dye. Yeah. Hi, Tamara. So the... Um, ROS production was with succinate, so RET, you call it, reverse electron transfer. Did you do experiments with, in the presence of rotenone, with other, um, with succinate to drive the ROS uh, production, say, downstream to complex three? No, we haven't tried this one. I mean, we have not checked the pH dependence, for example, with rotenone, but we were interested in RET, uh, so the reverse electron transfer, so that's why we did not add rotenone, because it blocks uh, the reverse electron transfer, so yeah, but it would be interesting to, to check how it modulates the H2O2 flux into the forward direction, yeah. Do you care to speculate? Do you think there'd be a difference? Probably not. Yeah, yeah but the other, uh, so the, the RET is the most dependent on the membrane potential and on the delta pH, so I think we would not see such a big differences with any link substrates, for example, yeah. Thanks. Okay. I would also have a question. Um, for more from a physiological side, you said you, you, you studied brain mm -hmm. cells. Brain has a lot of different cell types. So mm -hmm. did you sort out if different no. cell types no. would react differently? Or when I look to your paper, it does the myocardial cells behave mm -hmm. differently from the brain cells that you studied? Uh, so we did not separate the brain regions or different uh, brain uh, cells, unfortunately. We could not do this. Uh, but we did with isolated heart mitochondria, we, and we found exactly the same uh, results and, and data. Thank you very much, Nia. Thank you. <laughs>
So also hello from my side. I'm Michael Roden from Germany, from the German Diabetes Center. And I now have the honor to introduce the next speaker, who will be Anthony Molina, talking about platelet bioenergetics are associated with resting metabolic rate and exercise capacity in older women. Please. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share some of the work that's going on in my lab, which is focused on healthy aging and mitochondrial bioenergetics. So my goal for this afternoon is to give you a very broad overview of two recent publications. If you want to see the details of these, really, I encourage you to look at the publications themselves, one of which is uh, now available uh, on Beck, focused on platelet bioenergetics in, in older uh, adult women. And I'm also going to talk briefly about a paper that should be available any day now in Alzheimer's and dementia, where we're, again, utilizing blood-based bioenergetic profiling uh, and looking at associations with cognitive performance in Alzheimer's disease. So just for disclosure, all of the work I'm going to be presenting today is supported by the National Institute on Aging in the United States. And let's go ahead and get started. So our interest in mitochondrial bioenergetics and healthy aging is really based on these, these three parts to, to the, a simple premise. First of all, that one's genetics and chronological age is what defines your baseline mitochondrial function over time. So that's represented by this dashed blue line. But then things like uh, related to your behavior, things like nutrition and lifestyle or in the environment that you live in are then going to influence the rate and trajectory of these bioenergetic changes over time, represented by these green and red lines. Now, where you end up, your resulting bioenergetic status at any age, we believe is going to influence your risk and also progression of various age-related diseases and conditions. So we think of mitochondrial bioenergetics and bioenergetic profiling as an integrative and cumulative and measurable functional outcome that can report on biological age. And this is biological age as opposed to your chronological age, which is determined by uh, you know, your, your birth certificate. And we think biological age is a much more meaningful outcome related to, to your health as with, with advancing age. Now, I, what I'd like to emphasize is while different tissues uh, may have different rates of decline, Age-related bioenergetic decline is systemic, uh, and that's why in our studies of uh, frail older adults who are hospitalized or older adult athletes, uh, our community-dwelling older adults, or even here, these are uh, centenarians living in southern Italy at the cradle of the Mediterranean diet. In all of these studies, we're, we're looking at systemic relationships. So we're looking at both cognitive function and physical ability. And one of our primary approaches is blood-based bioenergetic profiling uh, with the hypothesis that measures of mitochondrial function performed in these circulating cells can again uh, give you a measure that's integrative of these cumulative effects on systemic bioenergetic capacity. This is based on a simple premise that these cells in circulation are going to be continuously exposed to factors that we know mediate uh, the bioenergetic capacities of various tissues. Now, blood, of course, blood-based bioenergetic profiling has a number of uh, advantages. It's minimally invasive, which makes it suitable for a wide array of patient populations, including some of the frail older adults that we work with. It's also suitable for serial assessments. So now we can do longitudinal studies, or we can monitor responses to intervention. So the first study I'd like to talk about uh, was, is derived from a, a study called Upbeat. Uh, and, and this uh, is a, a cohort that really has served as a control group for a number of our studies. And we worked with, uh, uh, with Ouroboros Instruments uh, to really define the, the mitochondrial uh, respirometry protocols that were utilized for the study. So thank you for your help in getting, us, uh, getting this study started a number of years ago. Uh, today we're going to talk about a sub-cohort of people, of, of women in this study. And these are women who are free of major age-related conditions. So we consider this our healthy cohort. So as you can imagine, it gets harder and harder to find very healthy uh, men and women uh, over the age of 65. But the average uh, age for upbeat was 70. Uh, these are the, the respirometric outcomes, and I'll tell you more about those in a second. But the clinical outcomes I'm going to focus on today are RMR, measured by indirect calorimetry. Uh, outcomes related to cardio cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and then measures of body composition, uh, including uh, measures of uh, adiposity uh, by whole body DEXA. 
here is the uh, representative trace of our uh, high resolution respirometry protocol of platelets. And so we looked at OxFOS capacity driven by multiple entry points and multiple pathways to the Q pool. And we also looked at ET capacity by uncoupling uh, the platelets. And here's what we found. So the strongest relationships we saw really across the board for platelets were with resting metabolic rate and also with peak RER. Uh, you'll notice the directionality of some of our other measurements are, in the, uh, are uh, as we would expect, so generally positive with peak VO2 and negative with adiposity. But focusing in on these two measures that were most strongly related to platelet bioenergetics, we saw that even when we controlled for age, BMI, and total body fat, these largely remained unchanged, so I'm suggesting that these are independent relationships. So, you know, we, we think this is a... a a quite significant finding. I think uh, there's a lot of studies, of course, focus on uh, physical activity, but keep in mind that physical activity only represents 15 to 30 percent of your total energy expenditure, whereas resting metabolic rate represents about 60 percent of your total energy demand. And for people like us who are interested in aging, RMR declines almost linearly by 10 percent per decade starting in your 30s. So we think this is a, a measure of particular significance. Uh, peak RER uh, is a measure that's related to lactate buildup, and it's used in CPET testing as a measure uh, of maximal exercise effort. Uh, and, you know, to our knowledge, at least in, in this patient population, this is the first to report that systemic bioenergetic capacity is related to this maximal achieved effort. Uh, of course, this study has a number of limitations. Uh, since we were focused only on healthy older women, some of the measures like peak VO2 and, and BMI had very small dynamic ranges. So we believe that, you know, we just weren't powered enough to see some of those expected relationships. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about our study focus on Alzheimer's disease. And this is of interest to us because there are still no therapeutic interventions that have proven effective for this disease. In AD pathology, we now know, uh, including the development of neurological damage, all this happens up to a decade before uh, a patient shows up at the clinic with symptoms. So there's a major focus at the National Institute on Aging on early detection of these pre-symptomatic pathological changes. And among these, mitochondrial dysfunction has been proposed to be a primary event leading to plaques and tangles that are hallmarks of this disease. So we've gotten a lot of support from the NIA to identify some of these antecedent bioenergetic signatures that are going to predict later life AD vulnerability or conversely resilience. So to do that, we're examining transitions from normal aging to MCI and from MCI to AD and related disorders. So over the past five years now in our studies of bioenergetics cognition in AD, we've been undertaking a longitudinal prospective cohort study of 500 older adults. What's neat about this group is that Every individual has been clinically adjudicated uh, to and assigned to cognitive status of normal cognitive MCI or AD. And this is by consensus conference by neuropsychological testing and also by neurologists. And so everyone has this at baseline. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is uh, some preliminary analysis focused on a subset uh, of people who have no other comorbidities. So we, we focus on, at least in this first paper, people who don't have other diseases like prediabetes and type 2 diabetes that are, that are very strongly linked to AD. So I'm not going to go over this uh, with you now, but please take a look at our paper. But what we were left with was 211 participants, 112 were uh, with normal cognition, 76 with MCI, and 23 with dementia. Now, I'll show it to you this way because it's, it's easier to see. So here's the, the neurocognitive testing battery. Uh, we found that the patients in the MCI and dementia group had lower cognitive performance based on a Montreal cognitive assessment. Same thing with the three minimental, uh, uh, minimental test. Uh, interestingly, when we looked at MPAC-5, this is a cognitive z-score looking at cognitive function across multiple domains. We see a nice stepwise decline as we go from normal cognitive MCI to dementia. Now, we consider this dementia due to probable AD because of neuropathology. So these patients have less cortical thickness and also pathological white matter hyperintensity. All right, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to go quick. Um, we did analysis with both intact cells and permeabilized cells, and we did this with both PBMCs and platelets. So first, let me talk, show you the results from the PBMCs. Uh, let's focus on maximal respiration. We do start to see declines when we look at the participants in our dementia due to probable AD group. 
But interestingly, when we look at our permeabilized PBMCs, let me focus your attention on max oxfos and what we call max ETS, we see a progressive stepwise decline uh, in, in bioenergetic capacity. Uh, data on platelets was interesting. I'm gonna focus your attention here on platelet maximal respiration. We actually saw an increase in participants with MCI and then a decrease with dementia. So I don't know if there's some sort of compensatory mechanism in an eventual crash. Uh, and then really a similar sort of pattern when we looked at uh, permeabilized platelets as well. I am gonna skip this, but everything we found was correlated with cognitive performance and also white matter hyperintensities. And we're now on, this study is still ongoing. We're still recruiting participants and we're focused on patients with AD and follow-up visits are ongoing this year. So if I'm back next year and I'll tell you how they do three years later. All right, and I just need to acknowledge the people who do the work. Three of my trainees have moved on to positions in academia and industry. We have open faculty recruitment, so please reach out to me if you're interested. Uh, if you want to learn more about our research, you can check out our website. If you want to learn more about our shenanigans, uh, my students run an Insta Instagram, whatever you call that. But yeah, follow that, and you'll see what we're up to. Thank you very much. Thank you for an interesting uh, uh, presentation, which is now open for questions, discussion. I see Dominic Pesta in the back first, please. Thank you very much. Fas fascinating insights. Uh, I have two, two methodological questions. So first of all, the, did you always take the samples in a fasted state, standardized? Is that the Yeah, standard uh, every participant was fasted and with the blood drawn uh, first thing in the morning. Okay, and the second question is, I saw you once referenced uh, to volume-specific flux or so in the beginning, and then and here you show the, the cell number. So is that your best way of referencing uh, <laughs> the, the flux, or would you do citrate synthase or mitoDNA? And can one of your conditions influence cell size, for example? Or something yeah, like all great questions. I should say that the, the, the Beck paper with Eric as a co-author, he's really taught us a lot <laughs> about how to normalize these data. There are really interesting um, things related to the composition of your PBMCs and also cell size. So with the platelet data, there seems to be some associations with mean platelet volume that we're just trying to understand. Uh, but all of this is a forthcoming analysis. Thank you. Question here on the, on here and then he and he. Oh, thanks Anthony, sure. very nice talk. I was wondering whether uh, the differences in platelet respiration were due to changes in mitochondria in the platelets or in megakaryocytes before uh, generating platelets? Uh, uh, we believe it's platelets. Uh, and, but yeah, maybe, maybe you can educate me some more after this about if we're interpreting this correctly. In the front, right side from me. Thanks a lot for your nice presentation. Your relationship between your uh, respiration and um, and biological age, or chronolo chronological age. No, um, there was this relationship you mentioned. Would it also um, go if you would take a longer cohort with more diverse population? Yeah. Um, yeah. With your RER and your resting metabolic rates. Um, does yeah. It, does it scale uh, also at a younger age? Yeah, no, great question and something that we're currently addressing. So yeah, both of these studies are focused on older adults. We have a new cohort now, that's the entire human life course starting from 20 to as old as, as we can get. And we're hoping to start looking at those questions, but also trying to, you know, we have lots of biomarkers of biological aging now. And, you know, we're, I'm part of a, a consortium at the NIA that's comparing these to one another. So we're gonna be comparing mitochondrial bioenergetic age, forgive me if, People don't like that term, uh, with other measures of biological aging like epigenetics and yeah. Thanks. Next question in the front left and then in the back left. Yeah, great presentation. Getting Thanks. back to normalization, there's different amounts of immune cells in your tissue compartment in the blood. And so if you normalize per millimeter, milliliter of blood, do you get a better association? And because that's gonna change um, based on exercise status, um, dehydration, et cetera. Uh, interesting, yeah, I mean, here we, you know, we, we counted and then loaded the same number. I, I understand but that, if but we if were you like back calculate that to the number of PBMCs per 
Yeah. Now, that would might be. Yeah, we can look at our culture data and and, and kind of related to that. that, if you look at the doubly labeled water consortium, that once you account for changes in body composition, there's really no age effect at all. So maybe similar with your mm -hmm. total concentration. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you saw any effects that complex one linked respiration at all, and uh, and also. What this, uh, if I don't understand me rightly, to say there's a 10% decline per decade in resting metabolic rate? And what, and yeah, I mean, what's the, the basis for that? Yeah, I mean, th that's, you know, really citing some, some, some old meta analyses uh, that's been done. Um, so, complex one, if, I mean, from, from what we've seen so far, it looked like all of the different states that we were looking at were showing this, this progressive decline. Uh, but of course, the, the decline was was much more pronounced when we were, were when we were looking at multiple entry points at the same time. Um, yeah, and, and I don't know exactly why they're all moving the same way, uh, but things to figure out. So I think we are at the end. The time is over. I think there will be a lot of further discussions and questions. I would also have a few. Uh, thank you very much, and we have to move on to the next. Next presentation will be a five-minute talk by Cesar Granata from Germany. The floor is yours. Uh, we discussed, and if Eric is okay with that, that those who make their presentation uh, in shorter than five minutes, they could be offered one or even two questions. So maybe this is an incentive to be brief. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to the organizers for allowing me to present. Uh, given that um, in the interest of time, let's go straight to the study design. So today I'm going to present some of the results from a recently published paper which investigated mitochondrial changes in humans uh, following uh, approximately nine weeks of training. So the training uh, was divided in uh, three different uh, training phases. Uh, the first one consisting of six hit sessions, followed by 40 more hit sessions and six more at the end. And we took muscle biopsy and performed per, uh, physiological assessment um, before the study and after each training phase, as you can see here. So straight to uh, the result that is important for today. Um, as expected, we saw changes uh, throughout the four time points in markers of mitochondrial content. Here I'm showing CS activity, which is being validated in muscle, but also changes in uh, selected subunits of the five ox force complexes. Because our interest was to uh, sort of find out what happens in a protein to protein level, so what we decided to do, because we want to run proteomics, was to isolate mitochondria to try and sort of eliminate the bias of um, changes in mitochondrial content. So we did isolate mitochondria, we then performed proteomics. We identified approximately one and a half thousand proteins and two thirds of these proteins were on non of non-mitochondrial origin. And this is not really a problem. The problem came out here when we generated the profile plot. Uh, so a profile plot is basically a series of lines that shows changes uh, at the four time points in each individual protein. And what we did here is we overlapped changes in mitochondrial proteins in uh, uh, blue versus non-mitochondrial protein in salmon. And what we see is that isolation of mitochondria was not able to control for changes because we see the same pattern of adaptation uh, that we saw before. So at this stage, what we decided to do is uh, we took advantage of bioinformatics. And what we did is we first eliminated all the uh, proteins of non-mitochondrial origin. Uh, and then what we did is we normalized each protein um, for a sort of a common uh, time point um, factor, which we named uh, mitochondrial protein enrichment. As, as you can see here, we were able to uh, sort of remove uh, this bias. So from this point onwards, we were actually able to see what happens on a protein by protein level without uh, the confounding factor of a change in mitochondrial content. So uh, just very briefly uh, to show how things change quite dramatically when we compare raw values versus best normalized value. So if we look at the first time point, what we see here is uh, really no change after the first six uh, training session. But what, uh, what we saw in the normalized set is a, a clear decrease, which we actually uh, re-baptized, if you want to say this, uh, prioritization and deprioritization. So 
When we talk about normalized values, we start talking about prioritization and deprioritization because these only measure changes compared to the overall change in mitochondrial content. So, and now to the key point uh, of today's talk. So, uh, mean, we generated mini heat map showing the pattern of change through each individual uh, phase for all the identified subunits of the Oxford system. And what we see uh, again is a marked decrease at the, uh, after the first six sessions. When we then compare this to uh, the changes that took place in enzymes of the TCA cycle and fatty acid oxidation, which as you probably all know are two of the main feeder of, electron, uh, of electrons to the OSFA system, what we saw is we saw a completely different re um, picture where at the beginning of the training session these were all markedly increased as you can see here. So we conclude from this that um, uh, to sustain the increased energetic and metabolic uh, demand of training, it seems more important to prioritize flow of oxygen to the chain rather than in, uh, increase the, um, the chain per se, so the Oxford system per se. So in conclusion, uh, what we uh, find here is that once we uh, were able to remove the bias arising from the, the different, sorry, the changes in the different time points, we were able to uh, identify an intricate and previously undemonstrated network of differentially prioritized and deprioritized mitochondrial adaptation, which challenges our current understanding and also calls for reinterpretation of previous findings. You've got 10 seconds for questions if you want. <laughs> I think we have to move on. Yes, um, I agree. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much. And the next uh, will be by Nicolas Plas from Switzerland on calcium-induced mitochondrial adaptations. Your time is already running. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so it is well established that aerobic uh, capacity predicts all-cause mortality. And to increase aerobic capacity, there are several ways of doing one is uh, to do intense exercise, such as sprint interval training. So in that seminal study from uh, Martin Gibala's lab, they used uh, all out 30 seconds exercise, repeated six times and uh, for a few weeks. Another uh, modality could be MICT, moderate intensity continuous training. So roughly one hour of exercise, the maximum intensity, 65% VO2 max. And what was interesting is that when they compared uh, VO2 max increase after training, it was the same despite a 10 times lower training volume with SIT. So we thought it might be interesting to uh, look at the underlying mechanisms and what we did was to use these two modalities I've already described and take muscle biopsies before, immediately after, and 24 after one session of exercise, so acute adaptations. Um, we actually focused on uh, one of the proteins involved in excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscle. This protein is a renal receptor, which is a calcium release channel, so uh, responsible for calcium release from the sarcoplasm reticulum to the intracellular milieu. And uh, what is interesting with this protein is that in normal condition, uh, it's stabilized by a small protein called FKBP12 or calstabin, which uh, in normal condition, in resting condition, uh, prevents calcium to leak from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But under some stressful condition, this protein can be uh, modified and actually calstabin can be uh, released from the main channel which can induce a calcium leak and this calcium might induce beneficial mitochondrial adaptations at least that's what we uh, thought given previous works so in this uh, recent papers that uh, we uh, published recently and uh, mainly the work from the Zanu in the lab so we actually show that the renin receptor was phosphorylated, uh, oxidized, nitrosylated after the seat in yellow, but not after one session of MICT. And this was also associated with uh, depletion of calstabin associated to the main channel. 
so evidencing a leaky status of the renin receptor. When looking at OXFOS complexes, we could show that complex 1 and 2 were increased uh, 24 hours after exercise, uh, only in the sit uh, session and not after the MICT, so the low intensity exercise. Uh, in order to link both events, so leaky channel and uh, beneficial mitochondrial adaptations, we uh, played a bit with a model based on C2, C12 cells, and uh, we could mimic exercise either by stimulating them for one hour, mimicking MICT, or for several bouts of 30 seconds to mimic uh, seat exercise. What we could do with this model was to deliver or to apply a drug called S107, which stabilized actually the channel. And when we did that, we could prevent the increase in Oxford's uh, protein content. Uh, after one session of SIT, you can see that it's blunted with uh, S107, so when the calcium leak is actually prevented. It was basically the same story with uh, here uh, mitochondrial content, so with uh, mitochondrial red. So you can see that the increase after SIT was blunted with S107. You have the quantification just here. And again, this has a functional role because you can see that the increase in NADH link respiration that we quantified here after one session of SITS, or simulated SITS, if one can say, was also blunted with uh, preventing the leak of uh, calcium. And where does this calcium go? So we believe it's going into the mitochondria. I have no time to show everything here, but uh, probably through the MCU channel, calcium will enter the mitochondria, will activate PDH through a dephosphorylation, and you can see that this dephosphorylation of PDH is also blunted with S107. So at the end, we have this uh, model of exercise, intense exercise, leading to a calcium leak through the renin receptor, which then enters the mitochondria, probably through the MCU, uh, activate PDH and increased respiration. You have one second for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. V very nice study. Unfortunately, uh, we have to uh, move to the next one. Um, please. Fanny Pallet Stork from France will tell us about HACD1 and HACD2 genes in mitochondrial energetic efficiency. Thank you very much to the, the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to tell you how HACD2 and HACD1 first and HACD2 genes uh, control mitochondrial energetic efficiency uh, through the modulation of mitochondrial membranes phospholipid uh, composition. So um, our entry point into mitochondrial function uh, came from the characterization of a congenital myopathy uh, that is due to the mutation of HACD1 uh, gene and that leads uh, in, dog, uh, in dogs and human patients uh, to muscle weakness and exercise intolerance. And in knockout mice, uh, it leads to a reduced endurance uh, capacity. And HACD1 genes, uh, gene uh, encodes one of the four HACD uh, protein uh, of the endoplasmic reticulum uh, that catalyze the third step of elongation of very long chain fatty acids uh, that are fatty acids comprising 18 carbons uh, or more. And so we investigated um, mitochondrial function uh, in muscle fibers. Um, and first, uh, we observed dilated uh, cristae uh, that, was, uh, that were associated with a reduced phospholipid content in mitochondria. And among the different phospholipids, cardiolipin, which is a mitochondrial inner membrane uh, specific phospholipid, uh, was the most uh, reduced uh, one. And uh, we also observed a reduced uh, respiratory uh, coupling with a lot of uh, variations in the bioenergetic parameters of, uh, of uh, these uh, cells. And importantly, um, cardiolipin enrichment in uh, vitro on isolated mitochondria was able to rescue uh, the respiratory coupling, uh, whereas phosphatidylcholine, for example, uh, was not. So, HACD1 deficiency reveals that cardiolipin content controls mitochondrial coupling and energetic efficiency in muscle. 
In parallel, we investigated the role of HACD2 gene, which is uh, broadly and early expressed, and we found that HACD2 knockout embryos die at mid-embryonic development with severe cardiovascular uh, malformation. And these embryos display a reduction in mitochondrial uh, coupling, and they also display defect in mitochondrial structure, and in particular, uh, compartmentalization of some uh, mitochondria. And this is associated with a high amount of oxidized uh, cardiolipin. So, uh, in conclusion, a proper phospholipid composition of mitochondrial membranes and in particular cardiolipin uh, content and integrity requires the elongation cycle of very long chain fatty acids and itself is necessary for mitochondrial uh, structure and energetic uh, efficiency. More precisely, HACD1 gene is specifically required in skeletal muscle, uh, and its deficiency leads to mitochondrial myopathy, whereas HACD2 gene is broadly and early expressed, and its deficiency leads to severe mitochondrial dysfunction during uh, development. I would like to thank all the people who participated to these uh, large stories, in fact, uh, and all our collaborators and funding, and of course you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanny. There is actually some time for questions, so feel free to ask them. If, if I may uh, ask one question. Thank you. Um, I think this is very, very nice physiologically relevant data. Um, you, you talk about the, the elongation of the very long chain fatty acids. So did you actually uh, uh, assess the membrane composition of phospholipids? Or can you be sure that it's simply depending on the very long chain or a different uh, composition of the rather normal or short chain, which secondarily could affect mitochondrial function? This is an excellent question, and I must say that for the moment we don't have uh, the answer, but we, this is what we want to investigate, because in fact, at the moment, we don't have the missing point between um, the synthesis of very long chain fatty acids and the synthesis yeah. of phospholipids. Yeah. Um, so th th this is really uh, the question. Very interesting. Yes. But C18 are the, 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 the fatty acids that change the more upon HACD1 or 2 uh, mutation. There is even option for one more. We have 18 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so then, please. Why just the muscle and not the heart or the kidney? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, in fact, HACD1 is expressed in skeletal muscle and in the heart. And in the heart, we don't have any difference in phospholipid composition, mitochondrial function, and so on. But for example, HACD2 is highly expressed also in the heart. So what we think is that the heart is <laughs> even more protected um, with a gene redundancy. Uh, compared to skeletal muscle. But at least skeletal muscle has a specific genetic program. So, thanks again. Thank you we very much. We have to move on now. <laughs> and, uh, and next presentation is by Christopher Axelrod from the United States. And now we are moving to the intestine, if I'm correct. Um, just want to say thank you to the organizers for having me today, and we're going to switch gears to talk a little bit about intestinal mitochondrial function, which has been a unique opportunity that was uh, merged through a sort of interdisciplinary approach. So I uh, first just want to provide a broad background to sort of discuss how intestinal mucosa, which are really the cells that comprise the inner lining of the intestine, which are predominantly in pterocytes, but also can include bacteria and immune cells, play a very important role in nutrient absorption and cell metabolism. And we know that mitochondria are incredibly important to supplying ATP in this region, which is a highly energetic region, um, but also for absorption, barrier function, mucus, anti uh, antimicrobial molecules, and, and so on and so forth. So there's a number of um, physical and mechanical processes that need to be driven. Um, and despite all of this, that um, for those of you who could blast us into PubMed, there's very little active work being done um, for intestinal mitochondria, which is interesting because we know that the intestine alone can 
drive or resolve specific diseases such as type 2 diabetes where we know with Roux and Y gastric bypass you can bypass the foregut and essentially resolve diabetes within days of treatment, suggesting that energetically there's something very important happening that is sort of being left on the table. Um, so the purpose of this study was really to develop a procedure and a protocol to take specific segments of the intestine and measure their respiratory fluxes. So more or less what we did is we took the C57 black six mouth, we eustinized them, flushed the intestine with PBS, and then we segmented um, according to these um, sort of proximal and distal locations marked by the dashed lines, um, but uh, is the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And then we filleted it down the middle, opened up the intestine, we scrape the mucosa and collect it directly into Miro 5, and then we prepare it by gentle pipetting. And this is very different actually to what's in the abstract, and we'll call that a living communication because we've actually improved that approach because these are very, very fragile cells. And then prior to loading, we normalize by protein um, and then put into the chamber at a very low concentration, like 0 0.1 or 0.2 mg of protein. Um, and this uh, is not necessarily as clear up here, but this is just to show sort of the, what we get into the media, which are these large sheets of enterocytes. Um, and some of these little ones in blue are uh, just enterocytes that are already being freed, but with um, continuous pipetting that all of these become dislodged. But what you can see here is that there's very little immune cells or bacteria present. So it's really rich in enterocytes specifically. Um, and in terms of the respirometry approach, we measure NS-linked oxfos and ET capacity um, that's antimyosin sensitive. And then we also measure complex four activity through ascorbate TMPD coupled to sodium azide. Um, and then just to sort of briefly go through the results, what you'll see here from the top left to the right is that we see a, a stepwise decline ac across respiratory states by segment. So the activity is highest in the duodenum and lowest in the ileum, which we thought was incredibly interesting. Um, so we, then we followed this um, to measure citrate synthase activity, and we saw the complete inverse, where citrate synthase activity was lowest in the duodenum and highest in the ileum. So this is kind of where we're at right now. And then just to conclude briefly is that we know that mitochondria now contained within the IM of the GI tract are very robust and um, very an activity upon segment. And that we saw the activity was highest in the duodenum and stepwise decreased across the jejunum and ileum. And then we saw a sort of opposite trend with citrate synthase suggesting that there are sort of differences in volume or structure um, that don't necessarily explain the difference in activity, but right now we're working on different approaches like uh, structure, activity, EM, and other things to sort of elucidate what these things look like and why exactly they behave so differently. And then um, lastly, I just want to give a quick plug to my group. Um, so we are an uh, energetics group that are primarily focused on solving for obesity. And uh, one quick shout I want to give is for Chuck Hopple. For those of you who know him, he's a a legend in the mitochondrial field, but he could not be with us today. So I just wanted to uh, uh, give him credit for all of his mentorship and, and guidance over the years. And uh, I think I actually have 30 seconds. So any questions? Thank you very much. We have the option for one question. Um, we, this, this morning, we, we discussed the reversal of the Krebs cycle for protein synthesis or macro nutrient synthesis. The gut is very interesting in that respect because of the stem cells in the crypt and the extreme renewal uh, of, 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 of the cell. So now you're only looking into one aspect of, of the mitochondrial respiration. Um, could that explain the remarkable results and in, in, in that there was also a shift in, in cell renewal? It's definitely possible. We know that as an example in the duodenum that they're the most proliferative cells. Um, and as you cross the intestinal tract, so proximal to distal, that that um, activity declines. So that's, that's certainly a, a very plausible explanation. Um, and we are doing some different flow cytometry experiments and things of that nature to really differentiate um, what cells are there and sort of what sort of describes their behavior. But I think for our purpose, we're really interested in how the structure may differ. And um, one way we're kind of getting to that is to do sort of um, gastrointestinal manipulation, such as ileal interposition surgery, where we can kind of pluck one compartment of the intestine into another and see if it retains that functional capacity. So if it's innate, 
versus being adaptive. So it adapts to where it is and sort of the nutrient demand or the, or the pull, I should say, of the, of the segment. So. All right, thank you. Once again, very interesting data. Next up is our last speaker uh, for this session, Marcus Oliveira, who will talk about sterile activation of innate immunity, specifically target complex one activity and flight dispersal in the major arbovirus vector, Aedes aegypti. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Thank you, Eric, once again for this uh, kind of invitation to be here. So uh, and today I'll present some of the data that my laboratory is uh, devoting, uh, trying to understand how uh, mosquitoes uh, use mitochondria to make different things. And um, it, in this regard, I think the, it's important to point out uh, some basic concepts about the mosquitoes and how they are important for us. And so. For many uh, uh, mosquito species, they are able to transmit pathogens, different pathogens, including arboviruses, different kind of arboviruses that cause important diseases like dengue with hundreds of uh, millions of people affected, Zika and many other uh, viruses. And uh, for most of these uh, arboviruses, a uh, key species for transmission is the Aedes aegypti, is this insect, it's particularly the female. The female is able to suck our blood, uh, and uh, afterwards it waits. Uh, when when they when this insect uh, lands on our skin, it waits about one milligram, and in a couple of minutes it waits three milligrams. So imagine the metabolic effort that this insect had to face, where waiting three times its own weight and then flying after that. That's a metabolic challenge that uh, I I don't I don't think that is any equivalent in nature to, to do it. And this insect is spread all in many parts of the globe, and with global warming, this uh, scenario is increasing a lot. So uh, in this way, my laboratory has been devoted to understand how mitochondria operates in this insect. So for the last uh, years, we are trying to understand how mitochondria is, uh, is affected and affects different aspects in the biology of this insect. And uh, the set of data that we developed so far have shown that uh, glycerol phosphate and proline are the major substrates to maintain respiratory capacity in the flight muscle. But also these, ev these events are affected by the adenine nucleotide changes and the blood feeding sex and the female maturation, all everything affect bioenergetic capacity, oxidant production and flight. So, one interesting question that we asked was, uh, well, this insect is like a flying needle that is uh, naturally uh, transmits pathogens. And so the question we asked was, how this uh, metabolic costs for the insect when they, the immune response is activated? So for that, we need to consider that in general, the immune response from, uh, of insects are in a way quite similar to uh, our immune response in a way that they produce immune modulators as resistance mechanisms to cope with pathogens. But at the same time, this, these immune modulators have side effects on metabolism. So uh, in this way, in, the, in mosquitoes, there are different uh, signaling pathways that are activated upon uh, uh, the exposure to pathogens. For example, uh, fungi and bacteria uh, act, uh, trigger the tall pathway that eventually uh, stimulate the production of antimicrobial peptides and defensin particularly, which I'll focus this presentation. But viruses activate a different uh, uh, signaling pathway, uh, like the Zika and Dengue activate the JAK-STAT pa signaling pathway which also activate the immune response and production of antimicrobial peptides. So what's the cost? What is the fitness cost for this insect when they are infected? So there's a reduced longevity of dengue infected mosquitoes compared to non-infected and reduced egg laying from the infected mosquitoes compared to non-infected. So when we see you know, the huge problem uh, of dengue and all, the, all arboviruses, we think that the, the insects are not uh, sensitive to the infection, but at the end they are. 
So the question that we asked was, what will be the metabolic co costs of the immune activation in this uh, particular model? And to develop, to answer this question, we uh, develop an experimental approach in a way that we only work with uh, sucrose-fed uh, young females because this, uh, in this model, the insect can survive all the way uh, using just sucrose as a, uh, as a nutrient. And then we injected either PBS and or zymosin uh, in the hemo cell of the insects. And for different times, we had physiological and tissue-specific measures. Uh, in the tissue-specific measures, we focused on fat body, which is a, a kind of mixture between the liver and adipose tissue in insects. And then we measured the expression of uh, nitric oxide synthase and different CNA expression in the fat body. And in the same individual, we isolated the flight muscle and ass uh, assessed enzyme, mitochondrial enzyme activities, respira respiration, and oxidant production. And we also had physiological measures like body weight and induced flight activity. Uh, this particular is particularly important because we developed a method for assessment of respiratory rates at individual level in a single individual, in a single flight muscle for every uh, mosquito, which uh, we published recently. So uh, looking to the, to the data, moving to the data, we see that uh, uh, as early as six hours after Zimozan, uh, injection, we can see uh, an increase in different CNA expression relative to PBS, and we can see that uh, up to 24 hours, we see a huge increase in different CNA expression, indicating that the immune response is activated compared to PBS. And when we force the insects to fly, using a forced system for the insects to fly, we see that the Zimozan uh, activated uh, insects had a lower uh, uh, flight capacity compared to the PBS, indicating that there's a physiological response from the immune activation of the insect. But what are the metabolic impacts? When we look at the respirometry data for a single flight muscle of the mosquito, we can see here in PBS and the dashed lines in the zimosome, we see reduction, especially on the highest respiratory rates, and, but not the cytochrome oxidase activity. We quantified that. Uh, uh, on the leak state, there is no significant difference, but we saw a signif significant differences on uh, ATP linked uh, and reserve capacity and ETS linked respiration, specifically at 24 hours. Uh, when we measure the rotenone sensitive oxygen consumption rates, we see the redux significant reduction and also a reduced uh, complex one activity measured by cytochrome C reduction assay, but no changes on glycerol phosphate uh, oxidation rate, citrate synthase or cytochrome oxidase activity, indicating that this is a specific effect on complex one activity. And when we look at the, at the effects at individual level of defensin A expression as a measure of immune response and the respiratory rate, ATP linked, ETS and complex one activity, we saw a significant correlation between the activation of immune response and reduction in the respiratory rates, which in a way is not that different of what we observe in skeletal muscle of septic patients, indicating that there is a, uh, an evolutionary conserved mechanism from insects to mammals that compromises complex one as a result of immune activation. And uh, last, when we infected the mosquitoes with Zika virus, the same response in terms of respiratory uh, effect, we observed a specific reduction in ADP, induced respiration, and uncoupled by FCCP. So at the end, we uh, just want to conclude to say that the immune activation, either by toe or JAK-STAT uh, RNAi pathway in this insect vector, compromise the complex one that uh, uh, has an impact on bioenergetic capacity and in the flight ability of this insect. So I just want to thank the people involved in my lab in this work, especially uh, Dr. Alessandro Gaviraghi that made most of, the, most of the work in this uh, study, and also the funding agencies that allowed my laboratory to develop this work, and also, again, Eric and by all Ouroboros group for, this for the help. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Marcus. Great talk. I see the first question popping up in the front. Beautiful work. Um, Thank you. Do you know if Complex One is being down-regulated or is it being damaged? Uh, we, we have measured uh, uh, oxidant levels in this system and there's no change in either on hydrogen peroxide production, lipid peroxidation, and DHE uh, fluorescent staining. So, uh, and also the expression of nitric oxide synthase that I didn't show here didn't change. So we don't think that this involves changes in the oxidant production. It might be a reduction in expression levels on the total levels, or reduction in the protein content of complex one, I think. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, does the proline pathway in the insect uh, require complex one? That's a really nice question, Eric. And we measure proline, specifically proline respiration, and it is affected too. So the, maybe there is a mixed effect between complex one and proline dehydrogenase pathway as well. But I think we need to move on measuring specific activities of, uh, of, comp of proline dehydrogenase itself. Just a quick question. Do insects have TNF-alpha, and maybe that's the link between sepsis and your... Yes, they have a uh, sort of, yeah, yeah, a surrogate, yeah. May I also ask, ask a question? Um, in uh, the, the immune activation in, in, in humans, uh, lipolysis plays a key role. Uh, I have no idea about these insects. So if lipolysis could play a role, could there be also toxic fatty acids or whatsoever that would cause damage to, to mitochondria and explain that? Because you're obviously missing the link yeah. between the, inf the, the immunological reaction and the readout of, of uh, complex one. Yeah, in different models, uh, immune activation in Drosophila and other insects, it results in accumulation of lipids as lipid droplets. But uh, specifically in the flight muscle, as in Diptera, in mosquitoes, in Drosophila, the flight muscle don't use fatty acids as a main fuel. So we don't, we don't think that the lipids will, lipid oxidation will play a role in this setting, but we need to measure this. We didn't measure specifically fatty acid oxidation, but we don't expect that. What I mean is not lipid oxidation per se, but toxic lipids that might accumulate in parallel to lipid droplets. So what we see, for example, in human tissue, that there is accumulation of neutral lipids, but also of lipotoxic uh, substrates, yeah. mediators, which could have unspecific or indirect effects. It might be the case that lipid droplets might accumulate in the flight muscle. We didn't look at that. Yeah. But by EM microscopy images we have, we don't see lipid droplets accumulation. Just a very general question at the end. Um, do you think that your results on, uh, provide su support for like um, uh, therapies? Well, not well. Essentially, ways to um, kill the, uh, the the mosquitoes, especially the Zika. Well, so maybe the answer is linked to Eric's question because uh, insects. Most of the respiratory capacity in mosquito is driven by proline oxidation, and um, Maybe if there's a compensatory effect, which I don't think is the case because proline oxidation is also reduced by immune activation, it seems should be that the proline oxidation, if that is targeted, and I think the problem is that to find right inhibitors for proline dehydrogenase, maybe that will be a, a way to develop specific pharmacological uh, st uh, tools. So thank you very much. I think we have to close, even if you would have one minute left. But there is a poster session which is actually has started since about three or four minutes. So thanks to all of you. It was a very nice session, at least for me. And have a good meeting. <laughs>